Hey everyone, welcome to week 14, day one. So on the technical side, I'm gonna return to gouache. I really didn't think that it was gonna be a uh, single week thing. From the first moment I picked up gouache, I realized I'm loving this. I want to learn more from this. So this week, we're also gonna use gouache. I'm also gonna use different substrates. So that's gonna be exciting. But the theme of this week is gonna be uh, from black and white to color. So we're gonna use old vintage photographs from painters, like uh, portraits of painters. And we're gonna try to translate those uh, into color using gouache. So it's gonna be a pretty exciting week. Let's see uh, how we do. Okay, let's get started. First things first, um, I'm returning to gouache. So uh, last week's experience is really fascinating to me. I don't usually change my work habits. One of the most wonderful things about this project has been the fact that I can grant myself the right to experiment and to do as many fun things that I can imagine. In reality, this is just me pushing myself and the more intrigued I am by something, the more I am curious about how something works, the more I want to put myself in a situation that I'm uncomfortable in, the more attracted I am to the painting experience. Last week I thought, and I'll be completely honest, I thought it was going to be a one-shot deal. I thought we were going to do five paintings and be done with it. And it would be me just saying, okay, I tried this acrylic gouache and these are the things I learned and this is what I liked and let's move on. But honestly, I'm very, very curious about it because it awoken a bunch of questions that I have about painting, about the act of painting and about the pacing of my painting. Particularly, I recognized my lack of patience. <laughs> and I think one thing I noticed, and I'm going to try, I'm going to try. I don't think I can do it very well, but I'm going to try to mitigate it a little bit. One thing that I noticed was that I go very quickly from washy to almost dry brush. I was going to say washy to opaque, but I go washy to dry brush very, very quickly. What I'm noticing in gouache or let's be really specific, because a lot of you guys did point out that gouache, just traditional gouache, gum Arabic gouache, behaves a little bit differently from acrylic gouache. Some of you said that acrylic gouache is more akin to acrylic painting. I wish I had the authority to say yes or no to that, but the truth is, I'm coming clean here, I have done one acrylic painting, and I did that painting while I was working at the illustration studio that I worked in New York after I graduated. It was a very weird job. I had to do a house that had a face in it, almost like a, like an archimboldo. So instead of uh, fruits and vegetables, it had to be draperies and a lamp and a couch, and I had to make a face out of all these things like in a living room in a house. That's the only time I did an acrylic painting, and I remembered it being hell. I remember just me having the worst, worst experience because I had never done it. I had to do it in a day, in a single day. It was this strange job that needed me to do this painting very, very quickly. They wanted an acrylic painting because I, I would have felt far, far more comfortable in oil. But no, they wanted that painting dry. They needed to do a bunch of stuff with that painting. So I was the painter there and they were like, yeah, you should do it. And it has to be acrylic. And I was like, I've never used acrylic. It was terrible. I had a horrible time. That was my first and only acrylic painting in, yeah, roughly over 23 years now. So I have no idea how acrylics behave. I know in my brain, I can tell myself it's super easy. Just start with them very washy and build them up. You know, that's all you have to do. But what I've noticed with gouache, or at least with this acrylic gouache, is that there is a, such a fine, fine line between opaque paint and, and very transparent paint in terms of how much water you add to your mix that it just baffles me. You have to have such a sensitive hand to know where that sort of middle ground is, where you are slowly adding a little bit more paint. And my hands are not used to that. I am so used to just going, okay, this is my initial lay-in 
with maybe a little bit, you know, traditionally, I would maybe put a little bit of solvent, not anymore, because in oil paint, I don't use any solvent anymore. But I would use a little bit of medium, and then I would start just putting straight paint so much so that when I do workshops now, I just tell people, let's just use straight paint. There's no need to use solvent. We're not doing indirect painting. There's no need to use solvent, no need to use mediums. Let's just do an Alaprima with uh, straight paint. Uh, but with this acrylic gouache, I realized it is such a fine threshold that you have to cross between washy and then opaque that I'm not used to it. So I think I jump very, very harshly from wash to opaqueness, to just pure, pure opaqueness and dry brush. So a lot of thick paint, just very, very thick paint that I kind of drag across. That's not the most sensitive way to approach gouache or approach this water-based medium. I am totally aware of it. I'm gonna try to get a little more sensitive to it. I don't guarantee it's gonna happen in a week. I know enough about painting to know that these things take a while. These things take a long, long time. But I like it. Like I said at the beginning, I'm intrigued by it. It just really spurs my creativity and my imagination for some reason, just to try to be empathetic with this new technique. Like I said, it just feels like you're meeting a new friend and you just wanna to get to know everything about them. And um, because I had to find a reason to keep using gouache, I thought one of the coolest uh, ways I could just concentrate on my color mixing and just laying my paint down would be to not have a reference that was already conditioning me in the sense that I would have to translate one-to-one -one what I was seeing, but that I could be a little more expressive about it. So I thought, well, this is, again, a very traditional exercise when you're an illustrator. People like Norman Rockwell did this constantly and every other golden age illustrator. They would use black and white photographs. They were used to painting from nature, so they knew enough about color. The information that they had when they painted from life was the one that they incorporated when they were painting from black and white photographs. But the coolest thing is that they could use that knowledge that they had gathered from working from life and put it to use in the sense that it could be a very strong element in terms of storytelling. You don't just put color down because you want to make something look like nature. You want to put color down because you want to tell a story. Rockwell was just the king of that. He was absolutely fantastic at doing that. He always worked from black and white photographs and he had to make up the color and just his sensitivity is so insane. It just shows how much knowledge he really had. It was very, very deep, deep knowledge about how nature behaves, how light behaves, the essence of human expression. He was a genius. So what we're doing with this exercise this week is just we're gonna take some vintage photographs and I thought, why not do this turn of the century, late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. Let's use some of those early photographs because photography at that point was not ubiquitous, but it had been part of, certainly part of painting, but part of art for maybe 40 years. So painters had already assumed that they could use photographs. I'm not gonna say every single painter, but almost every single painter started using photograph ever since photography was invented. So this is something that has accompanied painting ever since it was there. And I thought, yeah, let's give this a shot. And because I was trying to do an exercise that had to do with color, my initial intent was not to try to colorize the photograph, like, you know, those people that paint with watercolors, um, those old black and white photos. No, m my intent was never going to be just try to imagine this as if it were real life, as if it were, you know, a color photograph. No, not at all. The black and white photograph only provides information. And information in the most abstract manner about shapes and values. That's all I'm going to concentrate on this week. The fact that these are just places where I can find enough information that I'm going to say, okay, this is my starting point, and now it's up to me and my painting to try to figure out what I want to do. I do have to look at my reference in order to check my values and check my forms. And like I said, 
kind of fish for shapes, for interesting shapes, and try to push those. But I'm going to give myself a lot of leniency here. I'm doing it just so that I can enjoy the putting paint down and just searching for color relationships. And I'm hoping that by the end of the week, I'm not only going to understand gouache just as a technique, because I think last week I was solely concentrating on how does this thing behave? This is just a foreign technique to me. Let me see how it handles under the brush. Let me see how it drags um, across this paper, because all of last week I was working on paper. So let me see if if I understand how it behaves on paper. I haven't tried it on other surfaces. I think I'm going to do that this week, but I didn't try it on cardboard or on more absorbent surfaces. I haven't tried it on surfaces that are primed or at least sealed with an acrylic primer, let's say. All I know for now is just how it behaves on a not super traditional watercolor paper, but a paper that does have a lot of fiber that it really sucks that paint in and how much I can do with a wash and how quickly I have to uh, start laying some opaque paint down. That was last week, but this week I am going to turn my, my gaze onto the painting. This is something that happens, it happens naturally, but I think it happens a little too often. And it's that when we're painting with reference, we many times favor the reference over our painting. So we start considering our reference as our aim. And I feel that that's something that's kind of wrong because if our reference is just our end goal, then why are we painting? Our end goal already exists. It may not exist as a painting, but it exists already. So what are we gaining just by making it a painting? It doesn't quite make sense. I think a painting has to behave, has to live, has to be created and has to be nurtured and has to be understood as a painting. A painting can't yearn to be a photograph. It's ridiculous. That, that's what photographs are for. So a lot of times people just see their objective in a photograph. I think it's very sad. I'm not saying that that's not the way painting should be done. There's a ton of photorealist paintings, hyperrealist paintings that are magnificent in the sense that they show how far you can push a technique and how much discipline there is in that endeavor because that takes a ton of hard work and dedication and observation. So technically, they are absolutely superb. But I just feel that a painting has so much to offer when you put your hands down and you just say, you are a painting, I'm going to respect your nature, I'm going to try to be faithful to your nature. I'm not going to try to make you look like anything else, I'm going to exalt the fact that you're a painting. If you turn your gaze from your reference to your painting, you're going to start looking at your painting. You're going to actually understand that this thing that you're making is quite alive and is something else and it's something that's totally different. So I'm going to try to do that and just have fun with that. One of the things that I'm willing to sacrifice by doing that is my drawing. Like I said, I'm going to have my reference photo as a starting point. That's going to be my starting blocks. You know, that's where I'm just going to jump from and I'm going to say, yes, I have all this information. Now let's get to paint. And I'm going to look at it to find clarity in terms of the relationships that I want from my shapes. But I'm also going to give myself the license to say, wow, this feels sharper. This feels squarer. And I'm going to see if I can push those things. And I was very happy that I found this Bonard photograph where he's at home kind of sketching with seems to be like pen and ink sketching maybe. And I thought what I could do is just have this painting grow from the bottom up. So I'm, I'm, I was going to keep the, the bottom part very washy and I was going to concentrate on the upper part of the painting. It's almost like the, the painting is aware of it being a painting and it's painting itself. That, that's kind of what I wanted. This painting holds a little tiny message of what the week is going to be about, which is shifting our awareness to our painting. But acknowledging also that we are working from a reference, from a photo reference, that is going to give us a bunch of information and probably the, the most useful information that we have is just values and shapes. 
After that, we could do whatever we want. We could do absolutely whatever we want. Skin tone could be any single color. Light can be whatever temperature you want. It doesn't matter. Like you have to create just a picture that has a specific mood. And maybe you don't want a very naturalist mood. What you want is like something super expressive. So colors all jumble together. It doesn't matter. Like they're competing for, <laughs> for the viewer's attention. It doesn't matter. It's more about looking at our painting and actually telling ourselves, let's try to make this work. And by giving myself those kind of artistic licenses, those rights, people that know me, they already know this about me, but uh, when I can distort, when I can push and pull and just find tension where there is none and almost break form apart and then find it again, I think I am the happiest. <laughs> I really, really do enjoy those paintings quite a lot because they are so, so liberating. When you're trying to portray nature faithfully, as faithfully as you can, it takes a ton of discipline. And that itself is a feat, which I will respect until the day I die. That is not easy at all. People that are good at that, it's because they've worked really, really hard. But... I've worked really hard and I want to give myself the chance to just experiment, to have fun, to just say, wow, this looks cool. What would happen if I pushed that arm? So in this, uh, in this particular painting, I think I misread maybe a handkerchief or maybe a little bit of, of negative space. I have no idea what it was. I think it's a handkerchief, maybe like a pocket handkerchief that Bonard had in his jacket. I think I mistook it for the negative space between his chest and his arm. And it makes no sense because it would make his arm, his left arm, just feel minuscule compared to his right. So I was like, oh yes, I'm so doing this. Like I'm totally <laughs> doing this. I don't care if, if I'm misreading the information in the photograph. I just like that. It is the catalyzer of my painting. It is providing me with this information that I can interpret any way I want. I could care less. It is going to be a painting. So it's not the color version of this photograph. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to say, this is where I start and my painting is where I'll finish. I love the fact that I can take those things and say, well, I'm not gonna care about that arm. So this week, again, concentrating on our painting, concentrating on all the relationships that we're generating in our painting. And by doing that, we can sacrifice drawing and it's totally fine. It's absolutely fine. I'm not gonna say anything. You don't have to show it to anyone, that's cool. If your drawing falls apart, who cares? Just look at your painting, make it work. Even if it makes no sense, just fight, fight within your painting to try and make it work. Yes, maybe one way of making it work would be just fix your drawing, check your drawing and make it accurate. But there's other ways of fixing stuff. Sometimes you just have to look at your painting and say, well, maybe if I make this shape broader, or if I make it brighter, if I make it more saturated, or if I let you know all of these blend, or if these are the same value, or you know, there's tons of ways just to make a picture work. So I'm gonna try to do that this week and enjoy the process. This is the first one. This is my uh, Bonnard. I think it has some of his energy in it, just very kind of scrambled colors everywhere. Um, no, not everywhere, but there, there's a lot of like little hues right next to one another. And I like that. I really like that. My, my objective was never to do a Bonnard. That's impossible. That's only him could do that. But it was just to look at something that inspires you and certainly looking at photographs of artists that I admire profoundly is a fantastic starting point for me. And then just having fun and then just saying, okay, let's see how much I can abstract this. And this is not how far I can go if I want to abstract this picture. I would totally love to push this as much as I can. I think it's a great starting point. So we'll see how we do tomorrow. That's it for today. Tomorrow again, Spanish Tuesdays. I hope um, everyone in quarantine is uh, doing amazing with their uh, Duolingo. So I'm positive that you know, you're know you all getting every single word that I'm saying <laughs> in our Spanish Tuesdays. That was a cool start. I think it sets up the uh, mood perfectly. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. As always, be patient. Stay inside if you can, and please stay healthy. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.